Europahuset and this seminar Rule of Law at War, where we will discuss the war crimes committed by Russia in their illegal war against Ukraine, how these are investigated and prosecuted, and how the EU and Sweden support this important work. This seminar is co-hosted between Folk och Försvar and the EU Commission's representation in Sweden. My name is Simon Järnberg and I work as program manager for global security trends at Folk och Försvar and I will lead today's discussion. A warm welcome to all of you here at Europahuset and also to all of you following us online. As a start, the deputy head of the EU Commission representation in Sweden, Erik von Pistolkors, would like to say a few words. Welcome. Thank you, Simon. Um, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Most welcome. I should be very brief because this is a very uh, central and important issue and I wouldn't want to eat into any of the time allotted to it by standing here and speaking for ages. Very delighted to be able to host this today. Very grateful to, to Simon and Folke Forsvar for helping organize, recognize the presence of the Ukrainian ambassador, Excellency, good morning. So with those few words, uh, let me hand back to you uh, for the deliberations. Thank you very much. Thank you, Erik. Russia's illegal war on Ukraine has been brutal, and the reports of potential war crimes have been many. The title of today's uh, seminar, Rule of Law at War, is deliberately uh, double in nature. The seminar will both discuss how the rule of war, law is working during the war in Ukraine, but also at the same time that the war is challenging rule of law at its core. In this seminar, we will discuss the architecture and the work carried out by the legal units investigating and prosecuting uh, war crimes in Ukraine. The support of the European Union to this work will also be highlighted, especially the EU advisory mission Ukraine, and also EU's work on the possibility to use Russian frozen assets in funding the reconstruction of Ukraine. Sweden has played an impart important part in providing support to Ukraine, and we will discuss both legal assistance, how Sweden work on investigating war crimes, and how the overall Swedish support to Ukraine look like. We are honored to have such a distinguished panel and uh, speakers at our uh, seminar today to address these issues. We hope that this seminar will bring light on the important work that is carried out to bring justice for Ukraine and for the continued need for us in Sweden, uh, the, work, the work at Eurojust. Quoted you were, um, uh, quoted by Reuters earlier this year, really is um, at point on why we need to investigate these war crimes. This damage cannot be undone, but, we can do, but what we can do is to ensure that those responsible are brought to justice. It's a privilege to welcome you to Stockholm and up on our stage. Uh, Miroslava Krasnobarova, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, first of all, thank you to organizers for organizing this event, to your presentation here. It's a huge privilege for me to be here and to speak to you. And uh, I will use this opportunity to tell you a bit how we see the architecture of criminal justice, how we are working and what are our goals. As Simon mentioned, indeed now in Ukraine uh, we have 110,000 alleged war crime registered. And this is, I would say, might be only the top of iceberg, because we never know what will happen when, and what we will discover when we will liberate the whole territory of Ukraine. And uh, this is different time of crimes. So some of them are really grave. It's mass, it's mass killing, it's tortures. Some are concerning the um, looting or destruction of civil infrastructure. And I would say uh, for the first layer, the, the main layer, we understand that the majority of this crime has to be and will be investigated and prosecuted in Ukraine. And uh, 
Indeed, uh, we have our own challenges, for example, but also we have uh, best practices already now. So we have specialized investigators, we have specialized prosecutors, and for example, we, find, we are finding solutions for the situation, for example, when we do not have access to the territory, but then we use the modern technologies, we use, for example, 3D drone scanning to assess the territory and to see the uh, site of the crime. And the second, but I would say that from the very beginning, when we saw the scale, it was obvious that it would be impossible only for Ukraine to deal with all these crimes on our own. And then I'm coming to the second layer, to the investigations, which are conducted also in other countries. Uh, we know so far, we know about 20 countries. It's both EU countries and non-EU countries that are conducting their own investigations. And uh, also there are other countries that are, for example, proactively collecting evidences, who are proactively collecting testimonies of witnesses uh, from, uh, that are in their countries. Their legal base for these investigations can be different. For some countries, it's universal jurisdictions, so their legislation allowed to investigate any of core international crimes independently of victim or uh, perpetrator. But for some countries, it's uh, triggered by the citizenship. So it can be citizenship, mainly it's the citizenship of the victim, but also it can be if, for example, the perpetrator is the territory of this country. And uh, I would say, our cooperation with these countries concerning these investigations is, pure, is purely driven uh, with interests of victims and witnesses. And here I must say that the role of EU and uh, especially Eurojust, the European Agency for Criminal Justice, was crucial. Because you can imagine, you remember those videos when dozens of thousands of people were crossing the Ukrainian uh, border trying to save themselves, save their children from the war. And the testimonies of these people were very important. And I remember these first days, it was difficult to predict what will happen to, in, a, in one hour, in two hours, in three hours, in a day. Um, but what we understood very clearly that we need to preserve evidences and ensure that those uh, who committed these crimes should, could be prosecuted. And I would say, uh, I remember, I, it's a bit personal, I remember myself, I was sitting there in The Hague, I was I am a licensed prosecutor for Ukraine, and I was thinking, okay, what shall I do? Should I pack my stuff and go home and help uh, people, help my, uh, my compatriots? And, uh, and then I understood also that uh, being there in The Hague, in this capital of uh, justice, it also means something, so you can contribute in different way. And uh, I believe it was less than uh, a week, it was six days, and we uh, had a coordination meeting at Eurojust to which we invited representatives of more than 60 countries. It, generally, it was more than 60 people there, and we discussed what can we do as a lawyers, as a prosecutors, as a investigative judges to uh, to collect evidences, to preserve evidences, and to ensure that they would be admissible for the prosecution. And it was agreed that we will establish a joint investigation team with those countries who already opened the investigation. At that moment, it was Poland and Lithuania. Especially Poland, it took the majority of Ukrainian uh, people who fled and uh, this has allowed us, and now it's joint investigation team, it consists of Ukraine and six other EU countries. And if you would recall the, uh, the map, so it's the countries mainly bordering Ukraine, or also bordering Russia, so it's Estonia, Latvia, Lithuania, Poland, and uh, investigation. But at the same time, with such a scale, it would be impossible even for the, all the resources of the court, and I know that also Sweden supports the courts very much with resources, to, uh, to do the investigation on their own independently. 
uh, with, without any kind of communication with other countries. And that's why uh, ICC joined the JIT uh, as a participant, not as a party, that allowed to, uh, to, to, to have this special status and have their own investigation independent from, from the countries. And another, uh, another, uh, another uh, important um, cornerstone of EU assistance, it was the creation of the core international crimes database. Because if you remember all the days, uh, it was uh, with regard, to, you do not know how to help uh, to preserve the evidences if, for example, something happened. And this and you need to, not just to keep them on some kind of flashcard or disk, you really to ensure this, uh, that these evidences are collected in proper way and stored proper way, and they would be admissible in, uh, in any court. So would it be a national court or international court? And uh, EU was very quick in its reaction. And already in uh, June, the new changes to the regulation to Eurojust uh, were into force that allowed uh, to Eurojust to collect uh, and to preserve evidences from different countries. And uh, why it is important? Because as I said, all this cooperation between different countries, it is uh, victim driven, you know, so it's their interests are in, uh, in the middle. And you can imagine, for example, the peasant fled Ukraine went to Poland. He, he or she was interrogated there. Then he or she goes to Germany and then to Sweden. And in every place, he or she can be interrogated. And you will have this revictimization again and again and again. So the whole idea of this database is to have these evidences in one place and to know that the person A was already interrogated and not to allow that he or she goes through this process one again. So with this database, we will go from this scattered environment when we have evidences in different places and we will analyze them and we will have them a full picture who has what. And another very important work of, that was done by Eurojust, by EU, it's uh, the coordination with the uh, NGOs. Because uh, I remember these first days we were approached from different, different people abroad and they were asking, how can we help? What can we do? Uh, how we can uh, contribute to the process? And uh, it, in this situation, it's, I always saying that it's important not only uh, to help, but to ensure that it will not damage, it will not cause any kind of damage. Because uh, people who are doing this work, they need to understand how to do this work and what they want to achieve in the end. Because, of course, you can talk to person, you can interrogate it, because it's not, uh, when NGOs are having interviews, it's not interrogation, but okay, you can talk to person, to take the interview of the person. But then you will bring these documents to investigator, and he would say like, thank you very much, but I cannot use it as an evidence, because it, had be done, it has to be done according to the procedure. Because when I will go to the court, the judge will reject this evidence, and that's why this piece of evidence will be lost. And that's why it's very, uh, it was uh, very important that the genocide network, which is based at Eurojust, it had a very, very close cooperation with different NGOs, with a key role player in that field, and they also issued a guidelines together with the International Criminal Court how to proceed, what is the best way, if you have found a victim, or if you, found, if you have found a witness, what are your next actions? What you can do, what you shouldn't do, and how to achieve the best result. And when I'm speaking about ICC, and now I'm coming to this sadly, and I was, I'm, I was one of the most important, because, uh, you know, uh, also it's in the beginning, I remember one of my, uh, uh, one of my colleagues uh, with whom we studied together, he sent me a message, like a mem, I don't know, it was like, uh, okay, you were studying uh, international law for five years, forget it, it doesn't work. And for me it was 
very important to ensure that uh, international law is working because it's this aggression, Russian aggression, it's not about only Ukraine. It's just a uh, it's brutal and very blatant violation of all international order. Everything that we have achieved for all these years, it was just crossed, you know, in, in one second because somebody decided to do so. And uh, I really commend to all the efforts that ICC is doing. And they were super proactive and they responded in very swift uh, manner, I believe, our... Uh, the, uh, our first meeting happened already on 28th, so immediately after, uh, after full-scale invasion. And already on the 2nd of March, ICC opened its investigation in the situation of Ukraine. And uh, recent, uh, a recent arrest warrants concerning the, Putin, concerning the President Putin and uh, Lvova Belova, it's a very clear signal that you cannot hide behind these immunities. You cannot hide because you are just the president of a huge country. So the international justice is looking, international justice is important and you really need to follow the rules. And, uh, when we, and uh, on the Ukrainian side, we are cooperating with ICC, I would say, on, on the ground on daily basis, because now they have their office in Ukraine. And this is uh, really why it's so important to prosecute it, because this is a, a mother of all crimes. If not aggression, there would be no war crimes, there won't, won't be crimes against Humanity, no genocide, but uh, I would like you uh, would like to use this opportunity and to ask you to look at also from another angle. You know, uh, when we are speaking about the crime of genocide, we also see uh, it uh, and the prosecution of crime of gen gen uh, uh, crime of aggression. We also see it as a possibility uh, to bring to responsibility those who is responsible for the deaths of Ukrainian soldiers. Because if you would imagine uh, those people who are fighting now in Ukraine, Ukrainian army, the majority of them, they were not military themselves. So they were IT guys, they were teachers, they were, uh, they were working on the, I don't know, some pharmacy fabric, they were prosecutors, we have prosecutors who are fighting, and they never ever in their life expected that they would have to fight for their country, for the independence of their country. And if you would look at law, very cynically look at that law, so if he or she was killed in the battle, it's not a war crime. It's not a crime of, against humanity. And then you are looking around, so these people are dying just just legally? Is it possible? No, it's not, it's not possible. And that's why the responsibility for the crime of aggression is very important. Because this is something those who started this aggression is responsible for the deaths of all these people. And you know, there are a lot of discussions about tribunal, how it will be, uh, format, etc. But for us as the prosecutors, it was... Uh, obvious and uh, that we need uh, to act already. We need to collect, to preserve, to analyze and to build the case of aggression, not to lose evidences. Because evidences uh, for the crime of aggression, it's a lot of OSINT. And what is OSINT data? Today you have it, if you didn't fix it, tomorrow it can be already cleaned all over the internet. And that's why, so uh, within these discussions, we, dis uh, we decided to establish this international center for the prosecution of the crime of aggression. And the whole idea is uh, to uh, collect the evidences, to analyze them, and to build the case that would be admissible in any court. So it can be tribunal, it can be national jurisdictions, or I know that there are some discussions about the extending of jurisdiction of ICC. So our main task there, my colleagues who are working now in The Hague, 
and uh, also their partners from JIT countries and also US is contributing, is to collect everything, to look, to analyze what we have, what we're missing. And all this should be really, I'm, I'm always telling to them, like it should be bulletproof, you know, because uh, this case would be really looked under the microscope and you need to be very careful what you are doing and to do it very, very thoroughly. And I hope we still have a few minutes. And if I might just maybe bring your attention to the a certain type of crimes that are not on the surface, you know, so you know all about tortures, killings, shellings of civil infrastructure. But uh, for, uh, for example, I want to tell you about the civilian detainees. So you've had about children that are uh, that were illegally transferred and moved on temporary occupied territories or to Russia, but there is a category of civil detainees. This is adults, but they are kept in the detention centers all over the occupied territories and Russia. And this is people who are detained without any kind of legal reasons or under some sham reasons. And they even do not have a chance to be exchanged, you know, for example, for military, there is always a, change, a chance to return. But for those people, we do not know what happens with them. We again. And last but not least, and this is something that we didn't think before, but it's also very important, it's the crimes against cultural heritage. You know, it's... Um, we always say that these cultural object, objects, they are also silent victims of the war. And it's, uh, it's not only about destruction, physical destruction of the historical monuments, but it's about looting. So, for example, uh, I remember I was talking to the prosecutor from uh, Kherson region, and he said that 80% uh, of objects of Kherson Historical Museum are not there anymore. So this is also something targeted the Ukrainian identity. And yeah, so this is something that I also wanted to share with you, that please uh, take care, uh, take, to ha be aware of these crimes as well. Thank you very much. I would say that this is all from my side <laughs> and I'm ready to respond to any questions. Thank, thank you. you so much for, <laughs> yes, thank you. Thank you so much for lifting the architecture and how you work and the coordination, but also at the end here that there are so many types of crimes that, that needs to be uh, investigated. I have a few questions, uh, and you will also come back for a Q&A at the end. Um, but I would like you to maybe talk a little bit more about the first layer, as you called it, the, the work in Ukraine. Uh, on the ground, how does the collaboration and cooperation between various agencies and actors look look like there? Yes, thank you for your question. And I would say that, unfortunately, we had our experience of 2014, when we had completely no, no knowledge how to proceed with the war crimes, and sometimes people were really mixing, you know, war crimes and military crimes. But uh, now we are working, there are several authorities that are involved. So the investigative authority, it's the Security Service of Ukraine and National Police of Ukraine. And uh, prosecutors is also in every case. And uh, what they have now and what really showed its efficiency, that they have these mobile groups which consists of the investigator, of prosecutor, of the expert. So if something happens, they go all together and they see all this uh, complex, uh, complex uh, scheme. And what uh, may be also important to, uh, to mention, for example, we have now the specialization, something that we also uh, deem as necessary, for example, for sexual violence crimes. Because to tackle this type of crimes, you really need to have a very sensitive approach. Because you know that uh, not everybody are, re are ready to share their pain. 
to share what happened. And it's not only women, it's also men, it's also children. And to every person, you need to have a special approach. And that's why we have this special unit within, this, uh, within the Prosecutor General's office that is dealing purely with uh, conflict-related sexual violence. And also we have a huge, so on uh, the side of, so we have this local, uh, local mobile groups, we have specialized groups, and we have the um, big specialized unit in the Prosecutor General's office, we call it, it has a long name, but we call it War Department, so they are dealing with this huge magistral case of aggression. Mm. Thank you. And you were touching upon it, uh, the, the crime of aggression, uh, and this... Um, uh, the center for prosecution that you're setting up and the work that you're doing. Uh, in your opinion, what is the probability that the crime of aggression could be brought to court? No court, so we can... ...the deputy head of the EU advisory mission Ukraine. The mission did, among other things, support Ukraine in law enforcement agencies in gathering evidence and preparing cases of war crimes committed in Ukraine. We're pleased to have Mr. Veslau here with us today to give some insights to this work and reflection, uh, reflections on the civil society's role in ensuring accountability. After his mission in Ukraine, Mr. Veslau has continued his engagement as chairman of the Reckoning Project, an initiative to train Ukrainian journalists and researchers to gather evidence of war crimes. I leave it to you, Fredrik. Thank you very much. Is this working? Yes, I, I believe so. Thank you very much, Simon, for that um, introduction. Um, I think uh, Miroslava really covered um, the whole spectrum, so I will try to add what I can uh, when, when it comes to this uh, extremely uh, important uh, topic. Um, both Simon and Miroslava mentioned this, this absolutely staggering number of uh, over 110,000 registered uh, war crimes. Um, the Ukrainian Office of the Prosecutor General on its website every day updates this, this number and every day it increases by, 100, by a few hundred. Um, and as uh, Miroslava said, I mean, this is only the tip of the iceberg because it doesn't really account for the crimes that are being committed on the occupied territories of Ukraine. And this is 20% uh, of, of Ukraine which is uh, currently under occupation. But what sort of crimes do we talk about when we talk about um, war crimes? I think this is, it's, it's quite important to sort of dwell on this. Um, I mean, the bulk of these crimes are not the result of negligence or, you know, the rogue soldier or random acts. But I think it's important to understand that these crimes are highly deliberate. They constitute state policy by, by the Russian Federation. So they're really intrinsic features of how Russia is fighting its aggression, war of aggression against Ukraine, and also uh, very intimately linked to its military and political objectives in, in Ukraine. And let me give you a few examples of, of this. I mean, first of all, um, as also Miroslava mentioned, you have um, the deportation and indoctrination of Ukrainian children. So the government of Ukraine has, up until today, registered around 20,000 cases of, of children, Ukrainian children, being um, deported to, to the Russian Federation. Um, there, they often go through filtration camps. Many of them are adopted by um, Russian um, families, even though they, their parents are Ukrainians and, and still are still alive. Um, and I mean, this is a very deliberate effort by the Russian Federation to really um, erase their identity as Ukrainians and make them Russians, to Russify um, them. And this is also um, part of Russia's effort to, in a sense, eradicate Ukrainian culture and ultimately also eradicate uh, the Ukrainian nation. So far, um, Ukraine has managed to return around 400 of these, uh, these 20,000 um, uh, children. And also in the occupied territories, you see how um, these children are being um, re-indoctrinated, all in an effort to intimidate. the wave of refugees into the EU to put pressure on the EU to sort of split the EU and, and undermine the EU support for, for Ukraine. 
Um, so I think these three examples sort of point to, again, how, how these crimes that we see in Ukraine are very deliberate. Again, they're not, they're not a question, it's not a question of negligence on the side of Russia, but they're a very, uh, very deliberate part of, of, of state policy. Um, so what is the EU um, doing to support accountability in, in Ukraine? And I'll point at sort of five um, big areas. I think, first of all, um, you have support for the International Criminal Court, and, and Miroslava spoke about this, of course. And this is, of course, um, extremely important. I mean, you know, the ICC is sort of the main investigating body, international investigating body um, in Ukraine. They've set up um, the largest uh, presence outside of The Hague um, in Ukraine ever. So the ICC office in Kiev is, is the largest ICC presence outside of, of The Hague. And it's working, um, like Miroslava said, on a day-to-day -day basis with Ukrainian prosecution um, to take these cases, uh, cases forward. Um, I think, you know, it, it's no surprise that the EU is supporting the, the ICC. I mean, the EU is an institution that is fundamentally built on, on the rule of law. This is reflected in how the EU works internally, but it's also reflected in the EU's external relations. And so it's nearly part of the EU's DNA, in a sense, to support um, efforts of, of the ICC. And I think, you know, this has already borne fruit. If you take the arrest warrants of uh, Putin and also Lvova Belova uh, for the deportation of, of children, um, this, is, this is quite remarkable. Um, and, I mean, I think we can expect that the ICC will be issuing more um, arrest warrants in the, in the months um, to come as well. But I think the, the big challenge here, of course, for the ICC is that it doesn't have jurisdiction over the crime of aggression. It has jurisdiction over war crimes, crimes against humanity and genocide, but not the crime of aggression. I'll also return to this a little bit later uh, when talking about um, the, sp the special tribunal. Then secondly, um, of course, you have individual EU member states that are carrying out um, investigations. I think there are around 14 um, states now in the EU doing this. Sweden is one of them, carrying out a, a structural investigation. I think we may hear more about this um, later on. Um, but it's not only states in the EU. We also have other states outside the EU um, carrying out investigations. And I think this is, this is uh, extremely important because... It's, it's important to make sure that um, accountability efforts in Ukraine is not only a, a Western undertaking, but it should be a global, international undertaking. I mean, you have the ICC, which is a, a global body with 123 um, state parties. But if you have other states outside the EU, outside the West, also investigating um, war crimes in, in Ukraine, this adds to the legitimacy um, of, of, these, uh, of these efforts. Thirdly, um, the EU is also part of something which is called the Atrocities Crimes Advisory Group. And this is uh, uh, an organization inside Ukraine, based primarily in Kiev. And it um, consists of the EU, the US, the UK, and other actors, including um, civil society groups. Um, the EU advisory mission, which I used to work for, is, is part of ACA, as it's called, the Atrocities Crimes Advisory Group. And this is really the main international support structure for Ukrainian uh, law enforcement agencies and also the Ukrainian prosecution. And it consists of uh, international prosecutors, uh, investigators, judges, experts on um, gender and sexual-based violence, um, who work hand-in-hand -hand supporting Ukrainian um, uh, law enforcement agencies, both collect evidence, but also prepare um, these cases. It works at the strategic level, so the ACA has helped um, the Ukrainian prosecution develop a prosecutorial strategy on how to deal with the vast number of, uh, of cases. But it also does more operational um, work, like uh, case file reviews, for instance, going through cases and advising um, Ukrainian prosecutors on how um, best to, to take them forward. Um, it also has, as part of its structure, um, so-called mobile justice teams, which are um, very rapid response teams of, of international experts that can go to um, a crime scene. Let's say there's been a missile strike in Odessa, then they can travel there in the same day and support the local prosecutors and investigators with um, collecting evidence and also sort of conceptualizing the sort of crime we are, we're talking about. Um, 
Then fourthly, uh, the EU also supports um, you know, efforts to set up a tribunal for the, the crime of aggression against Ukraine. Um, I mean, this has been mentioned before. Um, I think the big challenge, of course, is that the ICC does not have jurisdiction over the crime of aggression. But the crime of aggression is really, uh, as, as Miroslav said, sort of the mother of all crimes here in, in this context. And if this crime is not investigated, not prosecuted, then this crime becomes completely hollow, meaningless in a sense, because this is such a, a blatant prima facie case of, uh, of aggression. Um, I think in the, in the collective West, I mean, you have the, the, this core group, as it's called, working with the Ukrainians on um, the tribunal for the crime of aggression. And I think currently has maybe 30, 40 members, um, Europeans, the US, Canada, um, some non-Western uh, members as well. And they're discussing how best to, to set this up. So I think there is quite strong support to establish a tribunal, but there's still sort of outstanding questions on how best to do this um, and how best to ensure that um, the tribunal can overcome this challenge of immunities for the Troika, for the president, the prime minister, and also the foreign minister of, uh, of the Russian Federation. Um, I'm pretty certain that a tribunal will be set up at some point, um, given the sort of the political support um, for this. And also the ICPA, which is working within Eurojust, is really working towards this, doing a lot of the, the practical work already now, the preparatory work in terms of you know, developing legal briefs, looking at, you know, working on indictments essentially. Um, for this, but then it will need, you know, a tribunal a ju with, with jurisdiction to hand this over to as well at some point in um, in the future. Um, and then fifthly, um, and finally, I would say that the EU also has an important role in terms of supporting um, civil society. Um, I think what we've seen here with with this uh, with Russia's uh, full scale invasion of Ukraine is that civil society has become extremely involved um, on accountability um, issues. Um, as Simon mentioned, I'm the the chairman of the board of the Reckoning Project, which was an initiative launched at the start of the invasion um, by by journalists and lawyers. And the idea is really to train Ukrainian journalists and researchers to collect evidence of war crimes because they're often the ones you know, who go to the scene first and, and meet with victims and witnesses. Um, but they, they should be able to collect this evidence in a way which makes it admissible later in, uh, in court. Um, and so these testimonies that the Reckoning Project has collected are then used um, uh, in, in articles and documentaries, especially in the global south, to really highlight um, the sort of crimes that are being, uh, that are being committed in, in Ukraine. But the evidence, the testimonies are also used um, in, a, in a legal sense as well. So for instance, um, the Reckoning Project provided a so-called Article 15 submission to the ICC on the deportation of children. Um, and also, uh, the Reckoning Project journalists were, were the first to report, actually, that Russia was deporting Ukrainian, Ukrainian children. So you have organizations like the Reckoning Project, many other NGOs uh, that work on, on uh, both gathering um, evidence and, and um, supporting uh, you know, Ukrainian uh, law enforcement. But the big challenge, I think, in this uh, war is that this is probably the best documented war ever in history. I mean, the challenge is not that there is not enough evidence, but nearly that there's too much. I mean, there's so much evidence to go through, to systematize, to gather, to process, to secure um, in a way. Um, so this will be work that takes, uh, that will take many, many years. So let me conclude um, by saying that, um, I mean, the EU uh, considers that accountability for war crimes in Ukraine is, is really integral to the overall approach that the EU has to, to Ukraine and to its, its support for, for Ukraine. Um, these efforts are really quite extensive and, and, and comprehensive, but if you look at you know, the scale, um, this is really needed because this is, is an absolutely vast um, number of, of crimes that we're, we're talking about. And again, I mean, there is this um, accountability gap when it comes to the crime of aggression because there is no tribunal, there is no court that really has effective jurisdiction over, over aggression. Um, 
And this work will, will take years, if, if not decades. And I think just uh, my final point is quite, you know, I want to illustrate a little bit. If you look at the, the crimes committed by Nazis in, in the Second World War, um, you know, it took 70, 80 years. 80 years later, um, perpetrators were still being um, tried for this. So I can very well imagine that something similar will happen in this case. Thank you very much. Thank you, Fredrik. Uh, I think we have time for one short follow-up question. Um, you picture uh, a very bright uh, picture of how the, the European support looks like, but there has been voices raised of fear that the, uh, the support from the European countries and the EU uh, might be fading. What's your, your take on that and your understanding? I don't think so. I mean, this notion of Ukraine fatigue, I don't, I don't really buy it. And, and the reason I say this is because I think there is a, a very strong sense in Europe, in the EU, in member states, in Brussels, that Russia's war of aggression against Ukraine is so, such a fundamental challenge to Europe, to European security, uh, to European values and, uh, and principles. So um, I think you know, our, our leaders understand the gravity of this and are committed to, to supporting Ukraine. So I, I don't think that's a, that's a big problem. Great. Thank you, Fredrik Veslau. Thank you. And you will also be back for the Q&A. Thanks. We will uh, move on to a panel of Swedish experts to discuss uh, the topics of the Swedish support and also a little bit of the European support for Ukraine. Uh, we have Hanna Lemoyne, Deputy Chief Prosecutor at the Swedish Prosecution Authority. We have Elsa Håstad, Ambassador and working at the Secretariat for the Recovery and Development of Ukraine at the Swedish Ministry for Foreign Affairs. And Anders Anlid, Director General at the Swedish Chamber of Commerce. Welcome. And I've asked you all, we can Hanna here and Elsa, yes, good. Uh, I've asked you to give a short presentation from your, uh, your view on the support. And we'll start with you, Hanna Lemoyne. Uh, you represent the Swedish Prosecution Authority. And in the discussions we've had before this seminar, uh, you mentioned a lot of ways in which you have supported Ukraine, but also international uh, legal authorities, uh, but also how you work on war crimes from a Swedish angle, has been touched upon earlier, but also some of the experience from the war in Syria. So please present. Thank you. And first of all, let me just say how impressed I am by my Ukrainian peers, the work that they have done, how effective they've been in setting up a system and special, having specialized investigators and prosecutors working on war crimes, which I find, as with my experience, is key to success to be able to prosecute these types of crimes. Uh, and since Miroslava got a bit personal, let me do that as well. The day of the invasion, I was in The Hague at Eurojust for a coordination meeting regarding a war crime in a different region. And there's a few things that, or very few things that gets under your skin as a war crimes prosecutor. You've seen and heard a lot. But this, I thought this was something that really shook me, knowing that peers, uh, prosecutor peers in Europe were facing a war. And of course, um, knowing that as a war crime prosecutor, you can in some way assist because there's finally no peace without justice. Um, I think that is something that has helped me and my colleagues at the war crimes team in, in the Swedish Prosecution Authority. I will come back to the investigative measures that we have taken in relation to Ukraine, but let me just first uh, go back a little bit and, and tell you a bit about the war crimes team in Sweden, the prosecution team and the, and the team within the police, just to give you an understanding why I think we were quite uh, quick in open one investigation regarding uh, the Ukraine situation. So Miroslava mentioned that different countries work on different legal bases for uh, investigating war crimes. In Sweden, we use the, the universal jurisdiction tool. And from a decision from the Supreme Court last year, we know also that we need some sort of connection to Sweden to open an investigation and, and eventually uh, put a case to trial. But of course, just the fact that these crimes are some of the most horrendous crimes that the, the society knows about 
even that is you know, one thing to consider when we decide whether or not to open a case. The first uh, core international crime case that Sweden dealt with, which led to a trial, regarded former Yugoslavia, and that was tried in court 2007-2008. And, um, or 2006 and 2007, and uh, after that, 2008, it was decided that we need specialized prosecutors in Sweden for this. It's complicated to investigate these types of crimes. I think you all know about that. I will not dwell upon that. But it's important, and since um, a few years, or quite many years, we have a specialized team. To date, there's eight prosecutors working full-time in Sweden with uh, crimes against humanity, genocide, and war crimes. We cooperate with a, a unit within the police, which also is um, um, specialized, and we have a good cooperation with the Swedish Migration Agency, and we have good cooperations with many uh, peers in Europe and beyond, especially through the genocide network, which also uh, Miroslava mentioned, where peers meet at least twice a year to discuss these issues. So, coming back to Syria, which Simon mentioned, um, Sweden was the first country who had a trial regarding war crimes committed in Syria. I was a part of that uh, team that uh, was uh, the prosecutors, uh, prosecutors in that case, and that was in 2015 the case started in trial. That case regarded an opposition fighter who was convicted in the end for war crimes. And Sweden was quite criticized. Why do we investigate and put to trial an opposition fighter when the regime is, is so much worse? And as a prosecutor, as a lawyer, it's evident, we follow evidence. If we see a crime and we can, in, in, we can prosecute that, that's what we will do. But it also made us think that if we want to go uh, further and not just act on low-level perpetrators, maybe looking at what the Syrian regime is doing, we need to work on a structure. We need to pull a base and then work the way forward. And that's when we decided back in 2015 to open a broader investigation to build these structures to see who's actually responsible for the crimes committed on a higher level. This investigation that we opened in Syria has, has continued and I know that other countries are doing similar things and through the work in our, the Swedish investigation we could for example assist the, our German peers in their investigation that led to the Koblenz trial. The Koblenz trial were um, the first high level Syrian regime um, um, person uh, was convicted for torture, war crimes in Syria. So this is how we also see it. The evidence is shattered all over the world. It might not lead to a, a trial in Sweden, but maybe at the ICC or at Germany or, or in Ukraine. And we have a similar investigation that was opened later regarding the ISIL crimes, which have then led to convictions also in Sweden. So with this experience, not long after the invasion of Ukraine, we decided, uh, just a couple of weeks after, to open a similar investigation regarding uh, the situation in Ukraine, since we saw and we understood there will be evidence to, in Sweden, coming to Sweden, fleeing to Sweden, and, and we need to be there to make sure that we can assist in building the structure to find who's responsible, and, and of course there are many people that are responsible for the crimes that are committed. And especially, as Miroslava mentioned, uh, sexual violence is something that is extremely important to in an early phase, not sometimes always too early, because it's sometimes the victims are so traumatized they don't want to speak immediately, but to, it's important for them to know that we are here willing to take their testimony when they are ready. So that's why we opened this investigation and uh, we have um, collected evidence which of course we see can be, um, if not used in a Swedish trial, but there's no statute of limitation, as was mentioned by Fredrik. These cases take a long time. We've, we have prosecuted uh, people from Rwanda 20 years after the genocide. So 
there will be one day when there is just justice and evidence will be used. And if not used in Sweden as a society, this evidence might be used at ICC or another country. And of course, we also contribute with what we do here in Sweden to the CISED, the, the database that the Eurojust has opened up to collect evidence just like these. Uh, we also participated through the Genocide Network in, in the guidelines set up for, for the NGOs because we know that it's so important that the first um, interviews that are taken, the testimonies, are, are done in a good way so that it doesn't harm um, the, the for future trials, even though also knowing that it's extremely important that the NGOs find these uh, witnesses, which maybe not uh, the authorities can find. It was mentioned that the, the EU AM Ukraine, where also uh, Swedish prosecutors have been working, and we have also seconded to ICC. Uh, ICC was requesting assistance after they opened the case regarding um, uh, Ukraine, and we have, uh, after that, uh, contributed with three prosecutors working on secondment at the ICC. Um, in the in last year, we also held a couple of trainings for uh, prosecutors in Ukraine and the bordering countries. Since we see that we have um, good experience of working on war crimes, we wanted to share this. At least we, th we thought there's at least something we can do. So we initiated through the uh, the genocide network and the EGTN, which is a European training academy uh, that we should, together with our peers in France, Germany, uh, the Netherlands, assist in holding, holding webinars uh, on this issue. And we held a few webinars regarding this last autumn. Political commitment is a proof of the never wavering support for Ukraine that Sweden had. And this support that we started so long time ago has created all the contacts and all the credibility that we need today when we increase, scale up and change the support. And for reasons that we all know, we are more engaged today than ever before. The support for Ukraine, when it comes to finances, projects, corporations, it's also our muscles behind the political dialogue, behind our political vision, behind the political commitments that we do, because it's not only talk about democracy, it's not only talk about peace, EU accession, green transition, cultural heritage. No, it's actually real cooperation and today it's not only about EU accession although we are very happy for the decision that happened uh, the day before yesterday um, and we talk about the EU accession as the biggest peace project of them all but today it's also about justice and it's also about a rule-based world for Sweden this is about our own existence. For Sweden, this is crucial. For Sweden, this needs to take time because we know it will take time, but there are no other options. And uh, all of us know what is happening in Ukraine. We talked about it today. We know, uh, reading all the numerous reports telling us about uh, Russia subjecting Ukrainian civilians to extrajudicial killings, torture, enforced disappearance, sexual violence, and the illegal deport uh, of children to Russia and Belarus that all of you spoke about. As you said, Miroslava, we have international order at stake. And we are acting, Sweden is acting, everything you talked about today is also Swedish engagement and commitment. Because we know that justice must be served for the victims and rule of law must be a station of support that we have not.
you might know that this summer we adopted the, the biggest, the most comprehensive foreign aid strategy to a single country ever. And it is about the EU integration, but it's also about rule of law. That is one of the key priority. And there we have the civil society. And Friedrich, you mentioned the important role uh, that civil society is playing, and so did you, Miroslava. And we are so extremely proud that Sweden is actually supporting the key civil society organizations, because the work they are doing is extremely important. We also work with the UN family, we work with uh, reconciliation projects in 18 local communities. We support independent media to do independent reporting to mitigating the violations in Ukraine. the ground, supporting Ukrainian authorities, working with the mobile teams, so we are there as well. We also, of course, work on the UN level, both in Ukraine, through the development cooperation, but also on the UN level. And uh, we have also contributed to the establishment of a commission of inquiry together with the UN, UN Human Rights Council documenting war crimes committed by the Russian authorities and armed forces. Uh, we also support the UN Human Rights Monitoring Mission in Ukraine. So, as you can hear, we are committed on all levels. Um, and I think this is extremely important for us to be both on the political level, on the expert level, on the multilateral level, bilaterally, uh, and also through the private sector. Anders, you know more about this, but we also have a business community in Sweden just waiting to expand in Ukraine because that is also a way of mobilizing support and also supporting Ukraine. So, can we say that our support has shifted after February 2022? Well, shifted in one way, but I would also say added on. As I said in the beginning, the support and cooperation goes back 25 years. But of course we do more today, economically, politically, militarily. We are one of the biggest development partners, one of the biggest supporters. And uh, in total we have provided more than 2.5 billion US dollars since the Russia's full-scale invasion. So. If we take what we had between the 90s and 2021, so before the war, the support was also substantial. It was 3.7 million US dollars. So today, after February 2022, it's 2.5 billion. So, as you hear, it's a, it's a huge increase. So apart from justice reforms, economic development, reconstruction, we also have military support that is extensive. And uh, Ukraine, as you know, also reading in the media, have received some of our most advanced weapons systems. Um, we also have uh, discussions with Ukraine on the long-term security commitments in line with G7 declarations of uh, giving security commitments. This is also an ongoing process together with the Ukraine peace plan and Sweden has decided to be co-leader when it comes to nuclear safety together with Czech colleagues and French colleagues. So before I end, I also want to say that it is with great unity within the European Union family that we actually move forward towards justice. And in the middle of an ongoing war, um, Sweden is working in parallel with both reconstruction and preparing for justice to come. And we know from other countries that justice takes time, mentioned by all of you, Rwanda, Darfur, Second World War, 70 to 80 years. We know it takes time. Some actually say that it's a waste of time, it's window dressing. Of course it's not, 
because one day sooner or later we know that justice will be served and there are no other options for us. So Sweden will continue with the main tasks is to help Ukraine win the war, to help Ukraine win the peace and to get justice. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Last but not least, Anders Anlid. Uh, during the Swedish presidency of the European Union, you led a group that investigated if and how uh, Russian frozen assets could be used to finance the reconstruction of Ukraine. And you're also the director general of the Swedish, uh, sorry, now I'll say Swedish Chamber of Commerce. Uh, the National Board of Trade. Sweden. National Board of Trade, <laughs> sorry, good. Uh, so you have two hats here, but please tell us a little bit about your work. Thank you very much, Simon. And I am delighted to be able to be given this opportunity to talk about the work on frozen Russian assets for the support of Ukraine. It's an important issue, I think. It, I will try to make you know, cut a long and complicated story uh, as uh, short and straightforward as possible. And I'm also glad to have such an august uh, qualified audience and qualified participants here that know more about this subject than myself in many respects. Because here we are talking about a issue where we see that rule of law and the fact that we have a European Union, our European Union, under the rule of law, is actually putting limitations on legitimate quests for support to Ukraine, as you will soon hear. Uh, early on, after the um, 24th of um, February last year, as you know, uh, the European Union decided to freeze or immobilize substantial Russian assets. Morally speaking, it is, I guess, a no-brainer that uh, the aggressor, the um, brutal Russian war machine, the, the responsible Russians should be held account accountable and should, of course, pay for the enormous... Uh, destruction, material destruction, uh, caused in Ukraine, in addition to the human suffering and the death of innocent civilian uh, and other Ukraine uh, citizens. So, early on, after the uh, freezing of these assets, European leaders started to look at possibilities to use these assets for support for Ukraine's reconstruction. In uh, May last year, the 27 heads of state and government at their European Council uh, con uh, decided that this work of the group is that any proposals coming out of it should be in accordance with EU law and in accordance with international law. Uh, we were also managed to look at possibilities how to cooperate with partners outside the EU, mainly the G7 countries. When we started, there were no um, officially kind of certified information about the size of these assets and where they were. Uh, new regulations were um, decided upon in the 10th san sanctions package in February uh, that, that um, led to EU member states being obliged to to report uh, about these assets. And in May, we knew that there are more than 200 billion euros of Russian central bank's assets sitting in a handful of EU countries, most of it in Belgium, in uh, an institution called Euroclear, but also in Luxembourg and some other European countries. And we were also informed that there were more than 20 billion euros of private Russian assets, the oligarch, yachts, uh, real estates, and what have you. But the bulk of the assets were the official state-owned assets of Russia. And the work in the working party concentrated, for natural reasons, on these state official assets, the more than 200 billion central bank assets. And we had lengthy discussions about this, uh, looking at what EU uh, rules and regulations and law on ownership told us, looking at what international law told us about state immunity. And after discussions on this, one idea 
uh, came forward, which we f found in the group was worthwhile exploring. And that was since state immunity, as interpreted, I think, by all EU member states, uh, made it impossible uh, to touch the original assets and the lawful um, gains from the assets. If they were put in bonds, bonds ex uh, mature and expires, and the yield, the lawful yield from these uh, original assets should, should still be Russian. But now these assets were frozen, and since uh, bonds expire and the f financial instruments uh, mature and, and expire, uh, and deals are put on accounts in these financial institutions, they still tick interest. So beyond the legally kind of uh, claimed the contractual rights of Russia, there are additional windfall gains from these assets. And the idea in the group that we had uh, was to make sure that these windfall contribution, at least, should as soon as possible be used for uh, Ukraine's reconstruction. Um, you could say that these are uh, small amounts compared to the needs. The needs are enormous, as we know. But this would still yield between 2 and 4 billion euros per year. So it's not, it's, you can't, uh, it, it, it's, it's, it's sizable, it, it's important. Uh, we thought in the group, and I was uh, mandated by my government to push for this idea, that it should be possible to have formal proposals to this effect uh, 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 coming from the Commission. And, as you might have seen, Ursula von der Leyen actually promised that such a proposal should be put forward before the summer break at that time. I left the presidency first of uh, 30th of June, uh, but we had a interesting development at the end of the Swedish presidency in that while large EU member states were still insisting or questioning whether this was in accordance uh, with state immunity, the European Central Bank also entered the picture and Madame Lagarde and her uh, staff argued that even this step that we were pondering could uh, inflict on financial stability and on the st status of the euro as a reserve currency. And therefore, uh, there were, was a need for new discussions. No proposal came from uh, von der Leyen and the Commission before the summer break. The matter has been additionally discussed. And some progress, I think, is now being made. And as you might have observed at the uh, October European Council meeting, the 27 heads of state and government uh, agreed again that uh, decisive process, uh, and then I quote, decisive progress is needed in coordination with partners on how any extraordinary revenues held by private entities stemming directly from Russia's Im immobilized asset, assets could be directed to support Ukraine and its recovery and reconstruction consistent with applicable contractual obligations and in accordance with EU and international law. The European Council calls on the High Representative and the Commission to accelerate work uh, with a view of submit, submitting proposals. So that's where we stand now. And I think, personally, that this is still a short-term uh, possibility that uh, should be uh, followed and should be seized upon. We talked in the group about short-term uh, measures and long-term measures but because we know that this will not be su sufficient and we know that there are, there are wider needs. And in that context, I would like to f finish by making two additional comments. One is that we, of course, in the group uh, agreed with what the G7 group already <laughs> decided in Japan last spring, and the EU is, of course, part of this, that these immobilized central bank assets should be held immobilized until Russia pays for what it uh, owns Ukraine in terms of reconstruction. That's one important point. And my final point is um, to end where I started. There's that the perceived limitations that we have been operating under, and the, there are limitations, are of course also questioned by lawyers and in the, uh, the people who are much better versed than me to talk about international. and one over there, so the microphone is coming. I was too. I was. Is it on? Outside. Yeah. 
Uh, my name is Joakim Persson. I'm from FOI, the Swedish Defense Research a Agency. Uh, I have a question for the legal expertise. Uh, my focus, obviously, is how to defeat our criminal enemies, who, while they don't care about law themselves, are still prepared to use law as a weapon of war against us and our allies. Uh, like, for example, Hamas is uh, deploying their troops among the civilian population or under the civilian population or hindering the uh, civilian evacuation and uh, uh, I would like to ask the legal expertise uh, how we are supposed to defeat these enemies. Thank you very much. Thank you. I, I think we we'll take the question over here as well. Uh. Thank you. Uh, Ruth Brown from the Swedish Police Authority. I have a question for the prosecutors. Um, there's been, you've, you've touched a lot on identifying victims and collecting evidence. I could wonder whether you could say a few words about the work of identifying the perpetrators. Thank you. Okay, so I understood it as questions for maybe Miroslava. And yep. uh, yes, indeed. Uh, you know, there is, um, as you can imagine as a policeman, it's a huge work done and it's a very challenging one because uh, most of the perpetrators are acting militaries of Russian Federation and a huge amount of work has to be done with the OSIN data uh, because... Uh, I would say, okay, OSIN data and intelligence. And this is something that we are our main, uh, our main sources that we are looking. Of course, from time to time, we also are managing to find uh, the, open, uh, the information uh, when we are, for example, when we had counteroffensive last year and the Russians were leaving their positions in a rush. It also gave us a huge bulk of evidences that we can now use in our proceedings. But I would say that for, uh, for looking for the perpetrators, the main sources are OSINT and, of course, intelligence. Thank you. Hanna, would you maybe like to add something to that question? Yes. Yes. Sure. Um, in, in Sweden, of course, we cannot try anyone in absentia, which you can in other countries. But the idea about having a broader scope of an investigation is exactly that, to build the structures to identify who's the suspect. Uh, and also not on the just lower level, but also higher up in the hierarchy. And qu quite often when you interview, when you have identified a victim or a witness, that person can tell you about the crime base, sort of you know the crime that has been committed. But quite often you can also draw conclusions on who is the perpetrator in the, that regard. Uh, but another very important um, form of evidence that we're looking for perpetrators is people have more uh, structural information, like, for example, journalists who can have an overview. Um, but then again, it's quite often regarding uh, open source investigations, um, digital evidence, evidence that's left behind. Um, and in, in Sw if you talk about the Swedish focus, of course, then we're, then we're limited to the evidence that's available in Sweden, but that's also doing one part of the job. Yeah, thank, you. thank you. And who would like to answer the question of how to act if the, the enemy is not following the, the laws themselves? I, as, as a prosecutor, I don't go in and comment on if issues where I don't have a case, so I'm reluctant to do that. To me, just the, the main importance is something that we already touched upon. Uh, the idea on, uh, on following and respecting the laws of war uh, is important that we do investigate uh, and prosecute when we have evidence to show that this is reality, this is what needs to be followed. That's the only thing as a prosecutor and a practitioner I can say on that. Thank yeah. you. Anyone else wants to comment on that question? No? Otherwise, we had a question here at the front row, uh, and I saw a hand there. 
Thank you. Uh, I am Hans Corell, former legal counsel of the United Nations. Let me first thank all of you for very professional and precise presentation. I was really impressed to listen to you all. Um, I have one question uh, which I will put to Anders Arnold, but I would just say that this afternoon I will have a regular meeting with David Crane and Irving Kotler. Uh, the three of us have made a proposal for a special tribunal for the crime of aggression. And this is now discussed in the General Assembly. But I'd understand from listening to the Minister of Foreign Affairs yesterday in a meeting that uh, the issue has been somewhat stuck there. But my question to Anders is that I understand from my con contacts in Canada that they have already adopted legislation. Uh, back there also. European countries that are doing the same. I think Estonia is in this process as well and some others. Uh, we looked at the private assets as well in my uh, working party. In the working party I had the privilege to chair uh, and uh, felt that since they were smaller we should concentrate on the large chunk first. But there are also EU processes uh, underway, EU legislative processes underway that uh, would harmonize EU countries' ability and possibility to uh, to confiscate uh, assets held by private persons that have committed uh, a crime, and that's the base, that's the key to, to, to do this. And also, there is a process on the way uh, in, in sharpening how a crime against sanctions should be used in this in this in this perspective. So th this is uh, my answer to, to your question, which I think is a very good one. It shows, I think, that this is new territory for many of us, and it's difficult to follow all the. Uh, avenues and paths that are leading in different directions for different assets under different conditions. Uh, but I think we are moving forward. Thank you, Anders. And does anyone want to comment? Yeah? Please. Yeah, I can, I can try to answer that question. And let me answer it in, in two ways. I think, first of all, um, one way of doing what you say is for Europe to really be extremely firm on, on rule of law and upholding the international rules-based order and um, avoiding um, situations where we can be accused of double standards, for instance. So, you know, to sort of strengthen um, uh, the pursuit of, of justice and accountability globally, um, in a way. And then, the, the, I think the second answer to that question is also um, ramping up support uh, to Ukraine militarily, mi military assistance, so Ukraine can, can win the war. I think the West has been, uh, you know, helpful in terms of providing weapons and ammunition, but much too slow, much too reactive. Um, so if you really want Ukraine to win, we need to ramp this up, because this is the best way of ensuring European security more globally, making sure that Ukraine can win. Thank you. And Elsa, uh, you will get the yeah, final Yeah, I just wanted comment. to add to what Fredrik just said, that um, other things on a more... Uh, European level is the, the growing of the EU family. What is happening now when we uh, say yes to Ukraine becoming uh, an EU member, including them in the European family together with Moldova and Georgia, and when we have see a new energy for the countries in Western Balkans, that is also about preparing Europe, creating a stronger Europe. Uh, and I think uh, we should not underestimate uh, that as well. It's also a way of, uh, I wouldn't say prepare, but creating a stronger Europe. Yeah. Thank you, Elsa, and thank you to all of our speakers for your excellent presentations and your very interesting and thoughtful uh, points in this discussion. And a special thank you to you, Miroslava Krasnovarov, for coming here and sharing your important work in addressing the need for continued support. And thank you to all of you that have been here at Europa Huset and to all of you that have listened online. Thank you so much. Yeah. Yeah.